welcome to Eye on Horror, the official podcast of iHorror.com. This is episode 102, otherwise known as season six, episode three. I am your host, James J. Edwards, and with me, as always, is your other host, Jacob Davison. How you doing, Jacob? Uh, doing good. Happy to be here and very excited to talk about all the movies I've been watching. There are some good ones that we've got on deck here. Uh, also with us, as always, is your other other host, John Korea. How you doing, Korea? Doing good. Uh, struggling a little bit as I just had a spicy peanut butter and jelly sandwich. Uh, I didn't know spicy peanut butter was a thing. The, 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 the peanut butter was spicy. I guess there's like some uh, spicy in it. It's not like it's not like super spicy. It's just it, I kind of forgot that it was spicy peanut butter. And now my, it's like, mm. like my mouth's not on fire, but like, you know, the sinuses are going. So if I sound nasally, I'm not sick. I just had spicy peanut butter. Before we get started, um, let's discuss the Oscars because we just yeah. again ago, we were talking about the Oscars. <laughs> well, they, 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 they actually happened. <laughs> I know did. now. But um, and here's the big the big news is Laurie Strode and Short Round both have Oscars. Good for them. Boom. Yeah. Yes. Um, I honestly thought the Banshees of Inisherin was going to do what everything everywhere all at once did. And I thought they were going to run the table. The only thing that kept everything everywhere all at once from taking the big five is they didn't have a leading male performance. They cleaned up. And that one went to uh, that went to Brendan Fraser from the mummy. Brendan Fraser. Yes. Which I am absolutely stoked because um, for him, you know, I'm absolutely stoked about that because his performance in the whale was incredible. And I'm glad that I've heard a lot of people saying it was all makeup. It's like, oh, no, he gave that performance in spite of the makeup. He basically acted with his eyes. And uh, and actually, his makeup team won the Oscar for makeup, too. <laughs> yes, so, that's yep. true. And and also, the, it had a very special guest star with Cocaine Bear <laughs> uh, presenting with Elizabeth Banks. Yes, they brought out Cocaine Bear with Elizabeth Banks. And I can't wait till next next Oscars when Cocaine Bear comes out to accept you know, the awards for best picture. Uh, yeah. Well, let's talk about cocaine bear. That's a great <laughs> transition. Cause we're the Kings of transition. Okay. What do you guys think of cocaine bear? I thought it was fun. I really, I really enjoyed it. I think right now as of March 14th, cocaine bear is my favorite movie of the year. <laughs> uh, but yeah, no, I really dug it cause it did feel kind of like a throwback to the, the you know, those kind of old school animal attacks movies, especially uh, the ones by William Girdler, like Grizzly and Day of the Animals and all that, because it's like, yeah, Cocaine Bear is a focus, but also you got like this kind of uh, ensemble cast of characters and these interweaving plots of like the cocaine and uh, and of course, esteemed character actress um, Margot Martindale as the uh, kind of uh, uh, not not so great park ranger. Oh, she was brilliant. The cast was brilliant. It, yeah. The, the ensemble was amazing. And this is the scene that they are getting hell for because basically a couple of preteen kids, no, they might be oh. barely <laughs> teens. They might be like 13. They do cocaine, but they do it wrong. Yeah, they <laughs> eat the cocaine because they think that's how you do cocaine. Yeah, the, the boy is trying to act all cool. I've done it before. How do you do it? You eat it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, and, and that and even then it just showed them being stupid. And yeah, I mean, I've seen some like uh, panic articles be like, oh, cocaine bear endorses cocaine. And it's like, no, no, no. Like, like, kids do cocaine or, or like they eat cocaine. They just feel terrible for it. And it tastes bad. And cocaine bear is fucked up because cocaine bear does cocaine and fucks that bear up. If anything, <laughs> it's the ultimate and probably most effective campaign for anti-drugs because yeah. it's basically saying like drugs are bad. Look what it did to this bear. And also that bear really only attacked people that were involved with the cocaine, right? Like yeah. people who, yeah. like most of the people who were attacked had cocaine on them or in them and stuff. And or like attacking her, attacking them for the cocaine, co- attacking them for the cocaine. One of my favorite bits was um, was after the one victim that he kills. And I don't, this might even be in the trailer. I know I'm trying not to spoil too much. He kills a guy and there's cocaine on him. So he does a rail off his leg. <laughs> yep. Yeah, that's in the trailer. It's great. Is that in the trailer? I don't watch trailers. It is in the yeah. trailer. It's the- a trailerable moment. That's why I thought maybe it really it is. Be. Yeah. The two things that I appreciate the most about Cocaine Bear is a first of all, it's directed by Elizabeth Banks, who has been working for decades now and got her start and like has built her career on comedy. But one of the first comedies she was in was Wet Hot American Summer. And the movie opens with the exact same song that Wet Hot American Summer opens (laughs) with. So for me, that felt like a full circle moment. Like this was her saying, like, 
I'm doing a comedy now. I'm doing my thing and taking everything I've learned. And my favorite uh, thing at the beginning of Cocaine Bear was it gives you a stat and I forget what it is, but it's some stat about cocaine or something. And then the source is Wikipedia. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Oh, and also how they uh, do the opening of the movie with like a montage of all those like really over the top anti-drug PSA is like, this is your brain on drugs yep. and fucking Pee Wee Herman holding a vial of crack. Yeah. <laughs> and the other thing I really appreciate about it is the fact that there are so many characters in it and they casted them all perfectly. And every single one of them had a story. It wasn't yes. just like a generic thing. And the stories that each of like everyone has a storyline like that you could essentially have like a short film of just what they're going through with their shit. And it's so fleshed out and just almost unnecessarily very fleshed out all these storylines that have nothing to do with cocaine or the bear. And it's amazing because of it. Like you have stuff like I think one of the policemen has like a dog that he didn't want. Like you went to go adopt a dog, (laughs) but he didn't like the dog that he got. And then like as the movie progresses, it shows like, no, he's fallen in love with that dog. And it's just like, why are we spending so much time on this? Like, I'm happy that we're (laughs) doing it. It's it's it kept blowing my mind. I'm like, we just spent five minutes on another fucking subplot. He called up the, the, the adoption place. He's all, there's been some kind of mistake. I thought I was going to get one of these Labrador man's best friend type. <laughs> and he got this spooky little, you know, <laughs> princess yeah, doll. Just, yeah, with a little pink bow. It's so good. <laughs> it was, it's funny. Cause it, it's a surprisingly well-written movie for being about a bear on cocaine. Cause trust me, that, title is not a metaphor it is about oh. a bear on cocaine no and, but, th- and that's the thing too it's very well made very well acted all these character plots but it delivers on the premise of yeah. cocaine bear <laughs> yeah. like it yeah, just fully delivers a bear on cocaine doing what you would expect a bear on cocaine to do yep it, it, it's it doesn't pretend to be anything else but the thing is like you said the subplots and also i don't want to spoil too much about it but it, there's a parallel between the main character the, the carrie russell character and the bear that is made evident. It, it's it's just a really cleverly written movie, and it's clever when it has to be, and it's stupid when it has to be. So, oh, it's it's my favorite movie of the year so far. Yeah, I and the subplots uh, really did pay off and had really good casting. Like, I I would be remiss if we didn't mention uh, Ray Liotta as uh, like the uh, Southern crime boss who lost cocaine, so he sends his goons into the forest to get them. Let me tell you, Ray Liotta went out with some of his best performances these last years like i just finally watched many saints of newark he was phenomenal in that and i just watched blackbird on apple tv which is a phenomenal miniseries i highly recommend it but ray leota in that was insanely like powerful performance and then just finished blackbird going to cocaine bear and he gives an amazing comedic performance it was just like god damn ray leota was one of the best but he's not trying to be well, he probably is trying to be comedic, but it's so effortless that he plays the role straight. Yeah. But because of how it's written, it comes off as comedic. It's oh, it, it's dude, the more we talk about it, the higher it's climbing. It might yeah. even be above <laughs> number one right now. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I just love that they do that like opening kind of crime meeting at a Chuck E. Cheese. Yeah. Be- because his grandson is oh, yeah. <laughs> What, just that that whole bar scene when O'Shea Jackson meets with him and the guy's just sitting there and he's just like eating pasta. I was losing it because I'm like, <laughs> what is up with that pasta? There's nothing on that fucking pasta. And then O'Shea's like, can I get this? What's in it? And he's like, there's nothing. There's nothing on it. And I was just like, it's again, it's those little details that make this movie work so well. We're going to be the kings of transitions here because Cocaine Bear was written by Samara Weaving's husband. And another thing we saw star Samara Weaving. Scream 6. Yeah, by Radio Silence, frequent collaborators with Samara Weaving. We don't want to talk too much about Scream 6 because, first of all, if you talk too much about it, you spoil it. And second, we're going to do a mini-sode in which we're going to spoil the crap out of it. So yep. if you want to hear more, yeah, if, check out the If you have seen it and or you don't mind it being spoiled, go to our mini-sode. But otherwise, what do you guys think? Just broad strokes. Oh, I really liked it. it. Yeah, no, I thought it was good. And it finally did what so many other horror franchises did and failed to deliver on Ghostface takes Manhattan. Yeah, it went to New York. I I I liked it. That there's one thing I'm a little disappointed on, and I'll elaborate on this in the mini-sode, which may post even before this episode, but I thought it was a little too safe. And I'll explain what that means in the mini-sode because mm. it's hard to do it without spoiling. But um I'm probably gonna fight you on that. 
Well, okay. Then we. So, then all right. We'll, well, okay. Check out the hold, mini it, hold it, guys. We got. We'll save it for later. Save it for the ring. Save it for the ring. Uh, this, exactly. But um, the thing. The thing is, it. It is. Um, like you said, it pretty much delivers. I think it was a smart choice to set it on Halloween because that. Because also because Ghostface is such a phenomenon in that universe. It made it hard to figure out who the real Ghostface was because people are dressing as Ghostface on Halloween. You know? <laughs> And, mm-hmm. and I did like to that point how they had in the thing, you know, very early on in the movie, they're like, oh, because of the recent killings, you know, Halloween stores are selling out a ghost face mask. It's <laughs> yeah. like that is how people react to shit. Yeah. It's like, oh, yes, it, there was a lot of like really good parallels there. And all the people who wanted to be Ted Bundy for Halloween after, and, yeah. and the Internet, the Internet kind of turned on them. And it's like, oh, dude, do not be Ted Bundy for Halloween. <laughs> You're not clever. <laughs> oh, God. Yeah, no, they really um, nailed that kind of phenomenon of, you know, there's, if there's a controversy or, or there's like something really terrible one year, like a lot of people are going to dress up as Halloween. Like, remember when everybody dressed up as Tiger King for Halloween, right when that happened? <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, that's just a fun costume, I think. <laughs> Scream 6 really delivered on all the thrills. It, it was fresh. It still did. Like the spirit of Craven was there, but it was definitely Radio Silence's film. And I got to say, it surprisingly is, if not the funniest, the second funniest Scream movie. Like oh, I was laughing fun. so hard at so many points. Uh, yeah, it had so, so many great gags. And I want to talk about it so much more, but we'll save it for the mini. We will. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We'll, we'll talk about it. Um, so what, what else you guys have been watching? Um, well, I had a hell of a weekend, uh, specifically with Simag Void uh, on two fronts. Uh, firstly, uh, for March, uh, Simag Void decided to do a uh, March Movie Madness series of screenings. So every Monday they're doing a different horror movie set in and around movie theaters. So the week before they did Joe Dante's matinee uh, with Joe Dante in person. And I have to say, that's still probably one of my all time favorite coming of age movies. I just really love John Goodman as the uh, kind of William Castle type guy. And, you know, the man stuff's a lot of fun. And uh, yesterday uh, uh, they did uh, one of my favorite kind of meta slashers, Popcorn, starring uh, the great Jill Sholin, who was also there for a QA. and a And again, it's just it's a genius premise, you know, like a slasher, this kind of like family opera type guy is going around killing people with props from these Bolly Who old movies at a horror movie marathon. I, I just I love it so much. And it's just wild that it's said in or, or it was filmed in Jamaica. So it's got like a reggae soundtrack, but it actually kind of works. Uh, have, you, have you guys seen Matinee or Popcorn? Oh, of course. Love Matinee and Popcorn's a lot of fun. We actually have a theatrical sized poster for Popcorn in our apartment. And yeah, and it, also the poster, I think, is what really sold it for a lot of people because it has one of the greatest horror movie taglines ever. Buy a bag, go home in a box. And uh, and on Cinematic Void, uh, they had their seventh anniversary. So there was the Cinematic Void Seven Deadly Sins marathon last Saturday, where they played seven different movies on 35 millimeter from the history of the series. And uh, those movies were uh, The Warriors, uh, Beyond the Darkness, uh, Halloween Three: Season of the Witch in Super Scope, The Fun House, Toby Hooper's Fun House in Super Scope Two. Then uh, Green Clark's joysticks uh, for Chuck Norris's birthday that day. Uh, Silent Rage, where Chuck Norris fights a n- kind of knockoff Michael Myers type guy. And they ended with one of the most bonkers Italian zombie movies of them all. Burial Ground. Yeah, Burial Ground's dope. Yeah, no, that creepy little kid just is yeah, just such a creepy little kid and <laughs> aren't they all? it was also fun because uh deanna rooney was there and she always does characters for uh sim mag void shows so uh she was like dressed up as like a giallo black of killer and she was actually michael from burial ground uh and yeah so there's a lot of good bits and, and you know just uh, sim mag void is one of my favorite um film series programs in la so i'm really glad i, uh, I was able to to uh, be a part of, uh, you know, kind of a salute to that. And uh, that's still going and having a lot of kick-ass screenings. Yeah, dude. I've been uh, I've been hitting the uh, TV watching real hard since I've been fun employed, you know, hit watching a lot of Star Trek Picard, uh, watching a lot of Apple TV. As I, as I said, I w- watch Blackbird, which if you haven't watched that, it's Taron uh, Egerton or Edgerton, the guy from Rocket Man and Kingsman and all that. And he plays like, like a like a 
drug dealer who gets put in jail and he's given a uh, ticket out of jail if he can infl- like befriend a serial killer and get him to confess to murders. And it's hard hitting. Ray Liotta plays his father. Amazing performances. Really good. We also finally finished watching C with Jason Momoa, which if you're into post-apocalyptic worlds with great world building, C is incredible. Um, but I also had been hit in the shutter and I watched. Uh, have you guys heard of uh, Nocebo? Um, I've heard of it. I, I, I think it's on my watch list. I just haven't watched it yet. Oh, definitely check it out. It's from the uh, director who did uh, Vivarium uh, about a year or so ago. The one with Jesse Eisenberg. Oh, yeah, yeah. This one is it's uh, Eva Green and she plays a fashion designer who hires a, a nanny from the Philippines to assist caring for her family because she's getting she's gotten really sick. Uh, she's basically got Lyme disease from a tick, uh, although they don't outright say it, which is very frustrating. because the whole time, you know, people are like gaslighting and being like, oh, well, it's just in your head. It's just because you're guilty. And it's like I'm sitting there going, no, this is all the signs of Lyme disease. Fuck. Have you not seen the punk singer? Come on. Um but it you as the movie goes on, you find out that the nanny is actually connected to why she's sick. And it deals with the uh, themes of uh, and and critiques on fast fashion culture uh, and how a lot of fashion that's coming out that goes out to like Target and all those places are made via like horrible sweat shops and uh, slave labor and stuff of that nature. And it's really it's really gnarly uh there's some really great performances uh i really i had a lot of fun with it It, um but the ending is very gnarly (laughs) you're in for a rough time especially if you grew up around areas where ticks are prevalent the the bits with the ticks are not fun at all they're very squeamish so yeah nocebo it's uh playing on shutter right now so highly recommend it uh, one thing that I dug into that I just want to mention real quick because it's hilarious is uh, I saw a documentary called Corman's World. Uh, you, either of you guys seen this? Of, no, oh, yeah. not yet, but it's, if it's about Roger Corman. Yeah, it's exactly what you think it is. Yeah, it's a documentary about Corman, but it's funny because they talk to everybody. Jack Nicholson has a surprisingly big interview in it. He's there all the time. And the funniest part to me in it was um, they go to Ron Howard, who did uh, Grand Theft Auto for Corman. And um. And at one point, there's a demolition derby in the movie, and Ron Howard goes to uh, Corman and he says, "Hey, we need more extras for this, you know, because they only have like 75 extras. It's supposed to be this huge demolition derby, and th- they needed more." And Corman wouldn't go for it. <laughs> and, mm-hmm. and they were getting into this discussion about it, and Ron Howard's telling the story, and he says, "He says, and finally, at one point, Rod put his arm around me and said, look, Ron, you make this movie. If it does well, you never have to work for me again.' And <laughs> that is just." such a one that's the the corman film school in a nutshell if you make one good movie for corman <laughs> Never have to work for him again. i i love watching documentaries about uh people and figures and moments like that and corman is one of the coolest because if you do look at his catalog it really was a go hard fi- you know hands-on film school for a lot of big filmmakers and I'm I was so happy to see Nicholson in there because Nicholson was in a bunch of Corbin films before he took off. And even like uh, if you look into like the history of the terror. But he also does an awesome story about how um, he basically didn't really screw him out of it, but he kind of tricked Corman out of a percentage of Easy Rider because uh, he wanted to be paid more than scale. To, to write something for Corman. And Corman says, OK, I'll give you scale plus five bucks. <laughs> <laughs> And the next thing that Nicholson did was Easy Rider. And he's found some loophole to to basically take Corman off of that as a producer that would have made him a ton of money because it was easy freaking writer. Yeah. Mm. Wow. But tier, at one point, Nicholson is reduced to tears talking about Corman. I mean, it's a really genuine, honest. I mean, he loves the guy. And a lot of people say that a lot of people are like, look, if Roger Corman calls, we're there. You know, it's just it was a really sweet uh, you know, community film movie, which is it's just so good to see. And uh, I see that a lot in doing tro- going to trauma things and stuff. You see the families that are built around this, these fast paced indie film things, because at the end of the day, when you're making anything, you spend so much time with with these people. But when you're when you're doing it for even cheaper and doing it even quicker, you really have to trust and uh, get to get along. Otherwise, it's going to be a thousand times worse so uh it's yeah corbin's world is a, is a great watch it's very educational and lots a lot of fun 
as you guys know, a couple episodes ago, we had John Campiano on um, and he hinted and talked a bit about how he was working on a short film called Snapper, which was about the unmade snapping uh, killer snapping turtle movie uh, from the guys who made Attack of the Killer for, uh, Refrigerator. Well, TerraVision finally put out that Blu-ray for Attack of the Killer Refrigerator, and it's loaded with a lot of special features from those filmmakers, including Snapper. And that, that that's probably the most I've spent on a short film because I was like, I like I will eventually watch Attack of the, of the Killer Refrigerator, but Snapper was why. For a 30-minute doc, he gets so much information because it's, it's a fascinating thing because these guys had a bit of success with their two previous movies. So they're like, oh yeah, we'll be able to do this. And they invested a lot of money into making a, um, a trailer, you know, as, as like a uh, selling point for snapper. And it just didn't go anywhere, which was very interesting. Like they built animatronics, they built the snapper and they, they go into great detail about the limitations of what they were able to do with what little budget they had. But man, what a fun piece of, um, of, of cinema and you can you can feel the love from john and the other filmmakers as they're talking to them about it and oh man it's really cool if you're do if you're a fan of like low budget diy shot for as little as possible because that's all they have type of cinema get the attack of the killer refrigerator blu-ray it's it's with uh terror vision right now um and the special features are so much fun. Even if you're not like the biggest fan of that style, like the features are great and just learning how they did this and why and like all that there. It's really cool. What'd you think, Jacob? Yeah, well, it, it is always interesting to watch documentaries about movies that never were movies that never got off the ground. And I would say I would like to live in the universe where Massachusetts had its own giant killer snapping turtle movie. That'd be a great world to live in. It really would. And uh, now we are joined by a very special guest. It's Andrew Gordon McPherson. Did I say that right? Uh, yeah. Although yeah. <laughs> the joke, the joke I make is there's no fear in McPherson. Oh, but, nice. <laughs> Mc, Andrew Gordon McPherson. Yeah, but that might just be my Canadian accent. I actually have no problem with <laughs> Mc, Mc, McPherson. McPherson is actually like it's more like my Treehouse of Horror like title uh, <laughs> with an F E A. Yeah, for all my horror films, I should get them to like all uppercase F E A R. Yes, <laughs> that would be great. Uh, Andrew is the composer of, among other things, the score for Jacob's favorite Kids vs Aliens. Yeah. <laughs> if you've been listening, you've heard Jacob rave about that. And uh, oh, yeah, I have Korea and I actually caught up with it. And he's right. It's it's a pretty fun little uh, little alien invasion movie. <laughs> uh, thanks, guys. It was a blast to work on, uh, hopefully as much as uh, it was to watch. It sure was. Let, let's start with the question I always like to start with with people is how did you get your start? I mean, uh, y- as a musician, um, how, I mean, did you start playing in bands or how, how'd you get your start as a composer? Yeah. I mean, this is, this, there's a long sort of runway to this, but uh, long and the short of it is I played in crappy bands and I went to film school. You know, you're speaking my language. That's me. <laughs> I was about to say, is this your uh, biography or Jay's? No, no crappy bands. Sorry. The, I, sorry, the bands weren't crappy. I, I was crappy. Um, no, I, I got, I got super, um, I, I got super inspired as a lot of people do who grow up in small towns of uh, like punk and DIY and all of that sort of stuff. And I was, I always loved movies, but movies were on this like upper echelon of like, like that's like the Mount Olympus of like where stuff comes from. Like I, I never thought I would like get into making movies until really like my, my last year of high school, I think I saw Aronofsky's pie and I was really into like black and white photography and electronic music and um, and and all this stuff. I, I really thought I was going to like get into like I, I was going to try and like be a comic book artist that played like bass in a punk band. And, but then I like discovered sort of American independent cinema and I was like, oh, this is a way I could like do all of these things in some sort of fashion and so i like switched gears really fast and i like went to community college for for what it was called screen arts which is where i met jason eisner actually um and this is in 2002 2003 and so i was i was 
really like into music production and like playing bands and but i didn't really think of it as like my career path it was just like my just something i was passionate about and just learning a lot about but there was like transferable transferable skills to like i ended up doing sound for a lot of the student films i was working on and ended up doing a little bit of music here and there and i was like per, started to get more into like producing for other people producing a little bit of hip hop artists a bit of electronic artists as well as like playing bass in the punk band and it was just kind of a long like i mean i was a i I worked as a picture editor like well i said post assistant and an assistant editor then a picture editor for a long time like 10 15 years while and in the midst of that i had some sort of minor success in the music industry as well doing like doing uh tours and and producing and eventually like and i was doing a bit of music for picture all along but it wasn't until i guess uh about five or six years ago that it just became my full-time thing and it all made sense and actually it just like felt like i i feel like i can kind of do the scoring thing better than i could have was doing any of those other things like it was just like every everything coalesced so it was, yeah, it's a really long, long story short. Well, I said that at the beginning, crappy punk band and then went to film school. But uh, I feel like I lived your long story because aside from the success part that you've had, <laughs> <laughs> but the, the, the punk bands to film school. Yeah. Um, how did you get into to the horror scene? Was it all through Jason Eisner or did you have I mean, other connections? Well, it, it, in the most visible. Uh, I guess not because um, my uh, my partner wrote and directed a short called "And They Watched," uh, which I edited and scored, uh, which was really like the first short that I actually no, it wasn't the first short I scored. It was the first horror short I I, I scored in earnest, and that got licensed by the Fun Size Horror People. Uh, and it was, and it, I think it went in the collection at Alamo. So it like plays in the inter, not in the intermissions, but like, you know, how they have the random no, the pre-show reel, pre-show really. Thank you. Um, so I, we don't have Alamo here. So the, I, I go there, like it's been years since I've gone because of pandemic things, but anyway, yeah. It, so that was the first sort of horror thing that I did that, like, you know, it did the festival run and then it was part of fun size horror, that anthology, um, and uh then i did the i did the far cry dlc the dead living zombies one and which yeah uh, this video game and the it was uh the concept of which was like there was six or seven levels i think and each one was basically like there was kind of like this sort of b movie director type guy who's like pitching different executives on different types of horror films he wants to make and then you play this first person shooter game in this and each one is a different style of horror so i got to kind of cut my teeth on like doing a sort of john williams uh close encounters type of a like video game score and then doing like a cart john carpenter style and doing a uh holy mountain style doing like and just just like you know kind of like do a pastiche of everything um and then yeah and then i i actually reunited with jason uh because he was editing a film called goon uh last of the enforcers a hockey movie oh yeah and uh i was a big fan of goons i love those goon movies yeah so jason eisner was a was the main editor on that and i was his assistant and how that happened was he was living in nova scotia i was here in toronto and jason like just put a message on facebook like i need an assistant editor for a feature in toronto uh let me know if you guys know anybody who's good and at the time i was working i had a full-time job at a post house as an editor and I was like, hey, man, I know lots of assistant editors. I can help you out. Let me know the project. I can find you a good fit. And he's like, it's Goon 2. That's the Enforcers with its directorial debut of Jay Baruchel. Uh, You know, I want to find someone cool because we're going to, like, cut it in his house. And I was like, uh, I want to do that. And I love Jason. <laughs> I already had, like, I love Jason. We, we knew each other for years, right? And uh, I quit my full-time job and uh, went and jumped on that movie. Uh, and it was it was... It ended up being a good move for a lot of reasons. Uh, 
not least of which was the post house like closed six months later like went out of business like six wow. months later and the movie the post on the movie went for like 11 months so <laughs> so it worked out that way but um but no me and jay and jason just like worked a lot in his house on a lot on that movie but on you know at the time jason Jason had to duck out for a while to, he directed second unit on Adam Wingard's death note. And so we got to like, we got to like sort of, you know, be, be around while Jason and Adam were working on that a little bit, but there's all that stuff. And then Jason was pitching other movies and I was like kind of giving him little bits of music cues and, and I got involved. I like worked a little bit with the composers on goon just from an editorial side, but also like, um, you know, helping out in some other ways. Cause I, I did have a recording studio in Toronto at the time. And, um, and yeah. And then, uh, Jay's next movie after that was random acts of violence, which is a, a movie, uh, another shutter movie. And he asked me if I would edit it and co-score it. And, and so, you know, that was my sort of mo that uh, up to that point, the most like sort of major, uh, body of work I did in the sort of horror space i don't want horror space so it sounds, yeah. like a, <laughs> sounds like uh i'm talking about some kind of tech incubator or something but but like as far as like the horror stuff goes like that was a significant chunk of work both on the editing and the music side so so yeah and then you know from from there there's kids versus aliens and dark side of the ring and both of which are heavily influenced by horror and 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 I did a couple other features. I did the range. I worked on the ranger and uh, Ooh, spare, I love that movie. spare parts. I was yeah. just about to bring up ranger. Cause I was like, Oh man, punk rock background. That must've been a dream come true. Getting in, getting to do composing with like a movie that was so heavily involved with like punks and, you know, anti-establishment and what have you. Yeah. So that was the first full feature that I worked on as a composer. And I, I co-scored it with, uh, with Wade McNeil, who was involved in the music on goon, um, and, uh, I mean, he's, he's like his bread and butter is sort of like the punk stuff. I was more on the music production side at that point. Um, but someone, uh, someone asked him to be involved on that. And then he, I think he wanted my help to kind of get through the, the sort of technical aspects of it. But there was also a lot of like, you know, there's synth stuff in there, which is sort of my, more like my lane, I guess. And, and so that was the first thing that we, uh, we did together and it was the first uh first feature I, I did and first horror feature i did i guess nice and uh off of uh, uh your scores I, I was gonna ask um what would you say were some of your uh influences uh working as a composer scoring movies oh wow i mean from like my the fr i can't remember which was first but the first three movies i saw were ghostbusters one and two and batman 89 so uh in in the in the theater and this is when i'm really young i mean i was i'm born 84 batman 89 is 89 i think ghostbusters came out the year i was born and ghostbusters 2 is 87 or maybe or maybe a bit later um but i like to say that like like the number one record the day i was born was uh prince purple rain and the number one movie was ghostbusters and i feel like uh, that is the center of my di my like venn diagram <laughs> um, <laughs> and prince did the music for batman so it all connects yeah exactly uh like like spooky funk <laughs> 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 like, like, like um so so yeah i have a very high reverence for Danny Elfman and did like, you know, and going forward from there, nine, pardon me, Nightmare Before Christmas, Edward Scissorhands, and on and on. And, you know, El the Elmer Bernstein score on Ghostbusters, of course. Um, I mean, both of which are huge influences on kids versus aliens, but, but those are my earliest, like f the, the first film music that I loved. And, um, and then maybe, a, maybe a little bit like Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, uh, film the film a few years later uh, but um, um that's great to hear for me personally because the live action tmnt movie was such a big thing for me like i love hearing same. yeah i need those deep cuts brought up more there's that cue <laughs> I, I the name of it escapes me but there's that cue that plays when uh so Raphael is on the on the roof and the 
the Foot Clan attack and they throw him through. And then the like the antique shop catches fire. And there's this cue that and this is specifically the cue where like this cue is is like fundamental to like what I do now. I feel like it is so ingrained in like what I think works with picture. Uh, and it's it's kind of, I, I think it's in a weird time. Like I think it's in like seven, eight time signature and it's like but it's this arpeggiated thing and but it, and it's got like the these kind of big uh sort of digital drum hits and, and i can't think of the name of it off the top of my head but it's that cue especially from teenage ninja turtles but um but but you know that the, all of that stuff is fundamental but like i had no i had no like misconception that I could do what it, like I could do those like I could make that at that for for most of my life like I you know I was like you know Danny Elfman is like probably like the most prolific artist who's ever lived possibly like and like and when you're talking about like over I mean I think Hans Zimmer technically has more more credits but I like I feel like I don't want to I don't want to like I think he's got a lot of assistants and a lot of people a lot of helpers and yeah Zimmer does he has a staff <laughs> and and I think like Danny Elfman like I feel like how he like gets his hands in the slime of every note of and and so if you're talking about a guy who's like if there's 30 to 60 cues in a feature film and he's done 150 films Anyway, I'm I'm on a tangent about Danny Elfman, but like the the thing was like I I never thought I could, like I my music theory is really poor. Again, I come from a like very DIY DIY like sort of film music background, or sorry, a very DIY music background. I'm mostly self taught. I took some piano lessons. I quit. I hated them. You know, I took music in high school. I hated it. And but it was then like when I rediscovered sort of American independent cinema, the Clint Mansell score on Pi, which was like very electronic and sort of homemade in ways. And I'm seeing how that worked in the new idiom of sort of independent American films at the time. And then going back and like, once I got into synthesizers and programming synthesizers and music production, um, you know, heavily into Tangerine Dream and John Carpenter and, um, you know these these sort of like uh man in a basement with a tape machine and two keyboards and a drum machine scores and and I, and it became something that was like within was like you know for, for my first 15 years of working in the film industry I was like yeah i can i can make records but i i'm i'm not a film composer like i like i can't i can't write you a, at at that time i was like i can't write you a string arrangement or something like I but I can do like a really dope like you know drum machine and three synthesizers score if you want that and and I just got really good and honed my skills at like being a great music producer and you know like making records that had impact and and my story skills were bolstering through all my years of film school and hanging out with the likes of Jason Eisner and Jay Baruchel and and so I think that it all just coalesced to like, okay, now I need to like fill out the rest of my skills and like, you know, learn how to write a string arrangement and learn how to write a brass arrangement. And, and so that's, that's been more of the journey the last like, you know, half decade or more. That brings up kind of my uh, question that, that I've been wondering basically since I figured out that you also did uh, the, the music for dark side of the ring, the, the series, the vice series, mm -hmm. what is your process like? Because your scores, like you said, they're not real orchestral. It almost sounds like, like a guy in his basement with three synthesizers and a drum machine. I mean, it is, do you prefer writing that way just by your, by yourself or would you rather conduct an orchestra if given the opportunity? I mean, I, like, <laughs> Uh, yeah, it's. I think that sound told me my answer. Right? <laughs> I'm. I, first of all, I love like I love going in the basement and making music with the synthesizer. Like I I will do that till the day I die. Like my my when I'm ninety, I'll have a Prophet Five next to my deathbed with a in a Lindrum, and I'll be fiddling with like I have a compulsion to do stuff like that, and I love it because it is like un. It, it's it's like unrestrained like i'm not like to get 
60 musicians in a room and a that you know has enough recording firepower to actually record them and do it justice and it's you know there's a barrier of entry to that uh financially obviously now we did it with kids versus aliens but um i but i like i love i love the like i love them both but they're 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 different you know they're they're so different like uh because one one is like drawing in your or like drawing in your sketchbook and you know one is is like putting on an art show <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> like like uh and and they're both like t- very gratifying in different ways and and i like when i was really when i was really young i wanted to be a comic book artist and I studied comic book artists and I remember there was like this interview with Frank Miller, uh, who like drew Batman and Daredevil and wrote Batman and Daredevil. And he later wrote Robocop two, the, the film. And I yeah, think he, he, he yep. co-directed part of Sin City, which is based on a book he did, blah, 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 blah. Anyway, his, like, he had like a, a quote about comic books about like, why, like, why are comic books so like crude or whatever? And he's like, there's an energy that comes from having to deliver 22 pages a month or something like that that you don't get from any other art form where people are meticulously like you you just you need to get it out and there but there is like an energy you get off the page from that and there's like with dark side of the ring there's like i do an episode a week uh which is a which is 20 to 35 ish minutes of original music every week from the start until the end and I only get a break like if they need a break in editing so it's like it's very it like it's very regimented and it's very like uh like it's it's it push it ha- I like to push myself to the like I gotta fill that sketchbook kind of thing like like before the clock tick like runs out every time you know what I mean and that's you in the in the in your basement or in your studio, right? I mean, all, all that dark side of the ring stuff sounds like it's like carpenter esque kind of synth stuff. There's no orchestra for that, right? It sounds like there might be live drums. Do you use a band sometimes? Um, I play like it's it is all me. Um, there are like neoclassical elements where there'll be like sort of Philip Glass esque like little string quartet parts, but because like the I think the original sort of inspiration for that was very much Philip Glass's score on Thin Blue Line, but but to sort of like marry that with the Tangerine Dream, John Carpenter, 80s cinema feel. Um, and, but I'm like, I'm doing that, the sort of like neoclassical bits with the, whatever tools I can, whether it's bowing my guitars or using uh, sort of uh, sample based instruments or, um, and and yeah and then i play some percussion and i play uh i play bass and guitar and acoustic guitar and i have i don't know lots of other weird little stuff that goes into it but that it's yeah the production of it is all at my house (laughs) well my house now my my i moved out of my studio into my house some of the dark side of the ring stuff sounds like um you're waiting for the vocals to kick in (laughs) they sound like actual songs that are you know cranking along you know um i don't know if that i I, i'm gonna take that as a compliment um (laughs) no it is a compliment it is i i i think that i the way i write is from a like vocal first i don't i don't literally write a vocal for a song and then throw it out but like like i think of the the like key melody and sort of like write like and i and i want it to be singable and like have a hook and kind of you know what i mean and then i and then i sort of build up the arrangement around that and 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 then i tr- like with dark side because it's well, there's a lot of interviews it's like trying to like leave enough space for the interviews to be heard and uh at various degrees of success <laughs> so you're a songwriter more than a composer i'm i'm, I'm just busting your chops now <laughs> <laughs> um i i one i mean at the beginning of my like film composer journey i would agree with you 100 percent because i had written way more songs but at this point i've written way more cues for film and television and video games than i've written pop songs so 
kids versus aliens that's a film score that's not those aren't songs but the oh, yeah. the dark side of the ring are songs you know almost i mean they they sound like them to me at least yeah and and the tales from the territories which is kind of this the the sort of like sister show of dark side of the ring which came out last year a lot of that is like me trying to tap into 60s 70s 80s pop type production and and you know feel like the songs on the radio while they're like telling these kind of road stories i guess um so yeah that i mean that that informs everything i do for sure and uh how gotta ask is this kids versus aliens is now the third project that's very wrestling heavy you know, are you a big <laughs> yeah. fan of wrestling and what is what is it like because uh tales from the dark side there's a lot of love for wrestling in that show Dude, like it's dark it's side very, of the ring or sorry sorry dark side no. of the ring there's a lot of love for wrestling there but it it's about like it's in the title it's about the dark side it's about you know the not so fun parts of it but the love's still there so what is it like going from spending so much time in that on to showing that side of it to kids versus aliens where it's just pure, you know, that adolescent love for it. Um, yeah. Like I, I keep joking that I'm going to get business cards that say like prestigious wrestling composer. <laughs> uh, but also then like prestigious wrestling composer, like, a, like, a that I need to like, I need to actually like join a, a wrestling promotion <laughs> as well, just to like go, <laughs> go all the way with it and like have a gimmick. It's like the maestro and, and you know, something. Didn't WWF back when they were WWF, they had a guy who wrote all their entrance music. So yeah. Jim that, Johnson. Yeah. There you go. So, so he's the visit. only, he's the only more prestigious wrestling composer than <laughs> me at, 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 this, at this point. I maintain, um, no, he, yeah, his, I, his music's huge inspiration too. I think especially everything Jason does for sure. Like, I mean, he's tempted in wrestling wrestlers, theme songs into edits. I'm sure like, like he's very inspired by that stuff. And, and, you know, I, I am as well. Cause it's like, that's, that's a move or, when I was growing up and watching WWF at that time, it's like, that was a place where like everyone had a theme song and like, like, where do you get a better like education of like, when you hear the song, you know, what's coming than wrestling where the lights go out and you hear the bell and it's like, Oh, it's undertaker. You don't even yeah. like, <laughs> like, and, and as a, like just fundamentals of, scoring it's just like you can do that with every movie in some some format you know what i mean but going back to your question is like um yeah like i you know with dark side of the ring and especially like it's it's often because they're these kind of the formats more this sort of like prestige documentary style it's more about finding the storytelling of the characters and then like teasing in what i can from their gimmicks that is like tasteful in the like you know what is probably like the harrowing story of behind the scenes which is actually going on uh and then with kids versus aliens because kids versus aliens it's it's you know hyping that up because it there's this meta sort of narrative of like they have a they have a move they're wrestling in a movie that's in a movie (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and that and their movie is kind of also our movie and uh, all these things so um i i don't think too hard too much like 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 uh about it's just wrestling is just it's in the tapestry of how me growing up and you know i was a fan for a long time and then i got more interested in buying records and and sort of other forms of pop culture at some point. And then it came back around when I had, had to become a prestigious wrestling composer. <laughs> <laughs> and focusing on kids versus aliens, uh, we're wondering um, uh, when did uh, Jason Eisner uh, approach you about the project and uh, what was uh, your, your strategy in uh, making the score for it? Yeah, so I was working on Dark Side season three, and it was just about wrapping up, I think. And um, and he was like, "Yeah, here I got the script," and I didn't know much about it. I knew I like I knew so it's it's sort of it it's based on a short 
that he did as part of VHS 2, um, which is the Slumber Party Alien Abduction, which is an amazing found footage. Yeah. The dog film. cam. Yeah, the, dog, oh, yeah. The, <laughs> the infamous dog cam. And so I knew they, were, they wanted to adapt that. Uh, and I love that film, huge fan of that film. So obviously I'm just, and I love working with Jason. So I was just like hundred percent, let's do it. Um, yeah. So he sent me a script at the end. I, I had no idea what the timeline was. I thought it was just like, this is close to a first draft or like, like it was very early in their process, but they were getting ready to shoot it in like a couple of months. Like they, I think they had a really like quick development process. And so he sent me a script and I read it. I think he sent it on Thursday or Friday and I read it. And like over the weekend, I wrote about 10 demos of like I, ideas I had of. You say you got the script on a Thursday and the score was done by Monday. What? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I was still I was still uh, living out my uh, my dark side of the ring uh, schedule. <laughs> I was just like, so when do you need this by? <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, no, but I. I, you know, I was super inspired and I, I like to try to some like as corny as this sounds like this music does kind of like come in my head when I like uh, read stuff for the first time. So I like to try and like capture that in some form. Um, and so I send him that stuff and a couple of those were the foundation of stuff that went in the movie. But and, and also I think a lot of it he kind of listened to and played on set, especially stuff to like get people in the mood of like what the inside of the spaceship was going to supposed to feel like. Cause I think a lot of that was like on a set. So they, Jason likes to play music for the actors to like get them in the mood, I think. So he played some of that stuff. Um, but yeah, it, it, it happened like as far as movies go, like really fast. Um, Cause I, I think like, I think I got, I think I got the script in August and they were shooting in November and uh you know the the mix date was like the second week of the following august which is you, you know so so pretty pretty quick um and and yeah so so yeah i wrote i wrote these demos based on the script jason liked a lot of the you know most of that material um and then i like went through a process of kind of like trying to make a bunch of original sounds like a bunch of uh synth sounds mainly and um and he had sent me a lot of references like he of like different stuff a lot of playstation one uh music like really obscure playstation one game scores um but also stuff like he had this video of a guy playing a conch shell in a in a in an indoor pool so it had like really weird acoustics and the conch shell like made this crazy sound that I like sort of tried to recreate with like um these friction mallets on like different drum heads and um and uh yeah so I just, I just kind of like put all that stuff together and then uh you know by the time it was you know edited you know just hit the ground running with a bunch of material and and uh yeah that was kind of the process what do you have going next? Because Kids vs. Aliens, of course, is out right now on video on demand and uh, is coming to Shutter later in the year and uh, Blu-ray soon, too. But do you have any uh, project? What are you working on? I'm working on a TV show. And uh, sounds like you can't tell us what it is. And, uh, <laughs> I I don't think that I'm technically allowed to say what it is, but I if you if you like reading movie we, and other media sites there might be rumors of the thing that would not be uh, a shock <laughs> to find out that i'm working on um i you know I, I sorry i hate i hate like most of my life is like under this under the like dark umbrella of ndas yeah. <laughs> uh like until until the like sweet sweet morsel of a moment when it's the thing that i've slaved over for, for, for months it gets released into the and i can talk about it but it's like uh no i i write music every day uh and uh at some point the people who are paying me to do so will let me know when it's okay to tell people that i've done so <laughs> so where can um 
our listeners follow you like on, on the social medias and stuff to find out where the stuff that you can't talk about right now <laughs> uh when you can talk about it and where they can see and hear it uh instagram's really good uh Ango underscore composer. So Ango is just short for Andrew Gordon, A-N-G-O underscore com- composer. And uh, that's like the, the, the social media platform that I actually interact with the most. Uh, you know, I put up stories from time to time of if there's stuff I'm working on that I can kind of like share some little insights on. And there's tips and and you know it's sort of like a pseudo uh portfolio um but then you know kids versus aliens coming to blu-ray really soon and uh you know we're still working on a soundtrack release yes uh, i was gonna say format. uh dark side of the ring got a great vinyl soundtrack so i'm really hoping that kids yeah. versus aliens gets one too that was waxwork but if yeah. you yeah. we might know a guy if waxwork doesn't want kids versus aliens <laughs> we we got a. Uh, Devin Burroughs hooked up with a guy to get uh, the wretched. <laughs> we don't know if that actually was. <laughs> so it's not we like to think it is, but we, we like to think that that. Happened. Hey, I'll, I'll, I'll take it. But like, let me say this about like, like, I know that you guys are huge fans of film music as am I. And, you know, Waxwork did do like the most outstanding job for the dark side of the ring. They, I, I don't, I know that they're like stuff is continuing to come out from them that is great and but i know that the entire uh especially vinyl centric industry is being it was totally getting crushed by all the pandemic and and you know supply chain and all that stuff so it's like our random acts of violence score you know there was pre-orders and i think it was 18 months for it to ship you know and so it's like and I think that people are like getting really angry when they're like, they get, you know, they spend 50, 60 bucks for a like premium, you know, double color vinyl pressing of something. And then they, they wait until like two years and almost, and they've forgotten about the project. And, and so like, I think that, I think that that has meant that like a lot of the labels on the physical side are like taking a lot more like safer bets and stuff. Um, and so, you know, so it, it's it's a it's harder for sort of like a bit smaller movies to kind of like uh and you know to to sort of like find those outlets so uh i'm happy to uh to, uh, to talk to whoever about anyone who wants to uh make those things a reality because in, and in reality it's not all my like call either because you know often the you know studio or whatever you know we kind of own, they either own it or we co-own it in some fashion so um but uh yeah we're we're trying to figure out a way i mean you can hear you can hear kind of like uh on on my youtube you can hear sort of three of uh, the main cues from kids versus aliens which give the sort of three different flavors which is like the the classic fantasy sci-fi orchestral side the 80s more 80s kind of pop side and then some more like just aggressive electronic side of the uh sort of production so well it and it i think what did you come up with jacob april 18th it's out on uh blu-ray i I think and then it's going to be on shutter sometime probably around the same time so now if you can't wait till then like none of us could you can rent it or buy it on uh, voodoo which i think we all did (laughs) and uh yeah, and Apple Music and YouTube and all those good, good. As as far as um, I mean, aside from the music, it's just a really fun, watchable movie. I mean, it's seventy five minutes long. I always have time for a seventy five minute movie, always. Um, you know, it, it's and and this is probably explains why Jacob loves it so much. There's, have you seen Psycho Goreman? <laughs> There's serious Psycho Goreman vibes for me. The DP of Psycho Goreman is the DP of Dark Dark Side of the Ring. Oh, really? Oh, okay. Not Kids vs. Aliens. Um, so I I don't know all of the Psycho Goreman guys very well, but Andy, who Andy also like I work with a lot on Dark Side of the Ring and Tales vs. Ter- Territories. We actually are supposed to talk this week about something. Um, something you can't talk about. Something I can't talk about. <laughs> um, uh, but um, uh, yeah, I think I think that 
I don't I don't know that Psycho Gorman necessarily like I think there's definitely some cross pollination in the DNA of both of those films and and I I don't know whether it was intentional or not for them to like kind of have such let's call it chemistry with each other yeah. but there's a lot of people who 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 can I don't know they the the accents of both uh, <laughs> filmmakers are coming out a little bit I guess so I, I was yeah. gonna say no one does nostalgia better than Canadians right now yeah I mean, absolutely <laughs> especially yes. R-rated kids movies exactly. It, that's because up here we just don't get all the stuff that you guys got down here this is all this is all the current like we just you know we j- ghostbusters 2 is still the hot shit <laughs> yeah canada is in another uh, is in like a time warp what is the what's the parks and rec joke oh man wait until they find out kurt cobain died you know, <laughs> that small job mentality. kurt cobain died what oh, oh no. shit. sorry bud <laughs> all right i will uh Andrew, thank you very much for hanging out with us this morning and uh, and answering questions and humoring us like this. Um, anybody who hasn't seen Kids vs. Aliens, go see Kids vs. Aliens and listen to the music. Um, we, we'll get you a physical release somehow. <laughs> if Waxwork won't do it, we'll we'll because because we all love vinyl and we would love to have vinyl copies of Kids vs. Aliens. Um, so it, I appreciate it, that. I love I love your support. I I love your support in this. And while you're working on it, let's 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 look into uh, Tales from the Territories and uh, yes. let's look for a, the Ranger reissue yep. Ooh. and all these. Uh, I would love that. the full spread. Yep. So yeah, we'll yeah we'll 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 start repping you. Uh, <laughs> um. It, uh, so yeah, for, as far as we are concerned, um. You can contact us on any of the socials. We're at Ion Horror or iHorror.com because that's the site we all call home. Um, go to Ango underscore composer on Instagram. Is that correct? Correct. There you go. Cool. Uh, to find out what's going on with Andrew. And um, you guys don't care what's going on with us. You can hear that every two weeks. What's going on with us. <laughs> so um, thanks again, Andrew, uh, for yeah, joining thanks, us. Andrew. And um, appreciate it, guys. And to everybody else, we will see you in a couple weeks. So for me, James J. Edwards. I'm Jacob Davison. I'm Jonathan Korea. And I'm Andrew Gordon McPherson. Keep your eye on horror. (laughs) 